Welcome to Professor Martin's Christology 101 class this morning. A little definition, make sure we're all on the same page. Christology comes from two words, Christ and Logos. Logos meaning words. Christology is simply teaching. It is words about Christ. It is this teaching about who Jesus is and what he's done for us and why it's important. With me? With me? Okay, cool. Because I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna dig into this. All right, uh, this is a was a huge issue in the first 500 years of the Christian Church. There were councils, there were meetings, there were papers, there were discussions, um, all kinds of discussions going on about who Jesus was as both God and man, who he was, and why that was important to us. Now. The way we see those things, unless you're a church nerd like me and read some of the reports of those councils, where you see those things these days is in the creeds. The three creeds we have in the Lutheran church, the Apostles' Creed, which we said, the Nicene Creed, which we've said several times, and the Athanasian Creed, that great big long one that you've got to be an old-style Lutheran to read it on Trinity Sunday, otherwise you don't know it, but it's in the hymn book, look it up, all deal with who Jesus is. As both God and man. And the reason we need to talk about this is this is the foundation of our faith. It's the foundation of our faith and it's the foundation for what Jesus has done for us and who he is. Understanding who he is will help us understand what he's done for us and to live that out. Now I'm going to do this. Um, I'm not, this is going to be kind of a brief basics course course in Christology this morning because they gave me basically 20 minutes to do this. If you want me to be comprehensive, I need about two weeks. Uh, literally, we could talk for a long time if we want to be comprehensive on this. If you're interested in know more, um, Pastor John and I both have a set of books, both of them about a thousand pages each. Um, we can loan them to you. You can have all the reading fun you want. Okay. And doing that. But we're going to start with Luke chapter 2. Grab your Bibles or grab the bulletin. We're going to take a look at Luke chapter 2 because it, it leads into what we're talking about. And we see this Christology in Jesus as both God and man in Luke 2, beginning at verse 22. This passage starts and ends in the same place. And let me explain what I mean. Look at verse 22. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. All right? So, what two things were, are happening at this point in time with Mary and Joseph and Jesus? Number one is that Joseph has to bring the sacrifice for Mary and Jesus for their ceremonial uncleanliness. They were ceremonially unclean, unclean because of childbirth. It's the blood thing. It was ceremonially unclean because of the childbirth that took place at 40 days. 40 days for a boy, 80 days for a girl. Don't ask me the difference. I don't know. So it was 40 days. That's the first thing that's happening. The second thing that's happening is comes out of the Exodus, back in Exodus 12 and 13, where... Uh, the angel of death comes and claims all firstborn of Egypt. The law set would say at Jesus' day, all firstborn belong to the Lord. You had to redeem or buy back the firstborn. Jesus, as the firstborn of Mary, had to be redeemed. That was the two turtle doves, by the way, that they brought. So they're coming to the temple and walking into the temple, and Joseph is doing two things with his family. He's making the sacrifice for Joseph, for Mary and Jesus' uncleanliness and redeeming Jesus for the firstborn. He's doing something that every Jewish father is doing. Every Jewish father is going to do this. Now, the firstborns get the redemption, but the buyback, but every Jewish child, every father for every Jewish child is doing the same thing. This is an ordinary thing. Every human family does this. This is about as human as it comes in the Bible and in this story. So as Joseph starting off, this is a very human activity that's taking place. Go to the very end of this passage in verse 40. 
And all the in-between stuff is done. This is what it says. And the child grew. That's Jesus, by the way, remember? And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. What does that mean? It means simply this. Joseph and Mary did what Jesus, what every other Jewish parent did. They took him home and they taught him what the word of God said. Taught him what it meant to be a follower of Yahweh, what it meant to be a follow, to be a to be a believer, how he was supposed to live his life, what he was supposed to do, how he was supposed to act. He did something incredibly normal and human. With me? So the story starts with Jesus being it's incredibly human. It ends with incredibly human, but look in the middle of this. In verse 26. And it had been revealed to him, that Simeon, by the Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. In other words, simply this. Simeon was told by the Holy Spirit he would not die before he had seen the Lord's anointed Messiah. The one promised in the Old Testament, the one that was going to be sent by God, the one who was going to come and redeem Israel, who was going to be Yahweh in the flesh. Simeon was going to see this child before he died. And Mary's walking through the temple courts, and Simeon spots Jesus and goes, that's him. And he goes on to say this. Verse 29. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. If you're with us on Christmas Day, we talked about Jesus' name. Jesus' name means God will save. In other words, Jesus' name means salvation. So when Simeon is sitting there saying, my eyes have seen your salvation, he's looking right at Jesus. This is who he's talking about. Salvation is Jesus Christ. What God brings is salvation. Jesus does the very same thing in Luke chapter 19, verse 2, or verse 9, when he's in Zacchaeus' house. Remember Zacchaeus, we little man, we little man, was he in the story? He's Zacchaeus' house, and he goes into Zacchaeus' house, and he says, Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house. Who's he referring to? He's referring to himself. Salvation has come to his house today. We see in this story, sandwiched between two very human activities, Jesus is recognized as the Almighty. He's recognized as the Son of God. He's recognized as the one sent by God to redeem the world. Sandwiched between these two things. Now, we see Jesus as both true man and true God. So we're going to talk about each one of these as we go along. And if you want to write verse numbers down, fine. Uh, I'm going to fire Bible passages at you way faster than you're going to be able to look them up, uh, even on your smartphones. So just hang with me. Right? We see Jesus as true man coming out of Christmas time. Other than his conception, Jesus was born just like the rest of us. Born out of his mother, just like the rest of us. Jesus is 40 days old. What do 40-day-old babies do? Eat, sleep, and fill their diapers, right? Pretty much, right? Guess what Jesus did at 40 days old? It's hard to grasp that, right? You don't think of the Son of God doing that, but hang with me. Chapter 8, verse 22, Jesus is, has been uh, on a missionary journey, and the disciples get in the bottom of the boat. Jesus climbs in the bottom of the boat and goes to sleep. Why does he go to sleep? He's tired. Luke chapter 24, verses 30 and verse 42. Jesus is eating with his disciples. Why is he eating with his disciples? He's hungry. Luke chapter 22, verse 42. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's praying in anguish to his father. He's praying in anguish. Why is he praying in anguish? Because he's going to die. And he knows what it's going to be. He knows it's going to be crucifixion. He's seen crucifixions before. This isn't a secret. And you know what it's going to be like. And you know it's how it's going to hurt. We don't have to go to the passages where it says Jesus is murdered. You got that already. In the New Testament, when we look through, we see a very human side of Jesus. We see Jesus is tired. He's hungry. He's sorrowful. He's angry. He's happy. Jesus is Carl, our brother. All those things are valid. Jesus is as human as you and I are. And we say that in the creeds. 
We said that in the Apostles' Creed before. I'm going to quote from the Nicene Creed right now. Nicene Creed says, And he was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. We say that in our creeds. Jesus, on the one hand, is very human. But on the other hand, he is very much divine. He's very much, as it says, he is true God. Mark chapter 1, verse 24, Jesus is beginning his ministry, and up comes to him a man who's possessed by a demon. This is a demon from Satan. This is one of Satan's minions. This is Satan in this man. And the demon comes up and sees Jesus and immediately says, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. It's interesting if you look in the New Testament and follow through the Gospels, every time Jesus is confronted by a demon, they know exactly who he is on sight. The people don't catch that he is God, but the demons know it, catch it on sight, that he is God. Mark chapter 1, verse 24, Mark chapter 2, verse 5, Jesus is in Capernaum in a small house, and the place is full, and there's a man who is lame, and four friends drop him through the roof, and drops him in front of him, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And the people get all upset. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus says, okay, if we want to do it this way, fine. Tells him to get up and walk. Why? Because both are as easy for him. He can forgive sins or he can make people walk. Either way, he's God. Mark chapter 3, verse 11. Jesus is teaching by the Sea of Galilee. And he's in the midst of teaching. He's healing lots of people. And suddenly the people realize who he is. And the crowd goes over and falls at his feet and says, You're the Son of God. They catch it. They know who he is. John chapter 11. He raises Lazarus from the dead. Luke chapter 24 verse 6. The ultimate thing showing he's God where the angels declare he is not here. He is risen. Now I could go on at this point in time. I could go on. This is one of those things. I could, they're not going to let me do this for the sake of time. But I could go back. When we just started Genesis, there's a whole bunch of passages in the Old Testament that testify about this is who the Christ. This is what God's son's going to do. He's divine. And track those back to the New Testament. I could do that, but we don't have near enough time. I'll let you look all that stuff up yourself. Because it's full of that stuff as well. We see in the Old New Testament, at the same time that Jesus is declared fully human and see the human side of him, we see a divine side of him as well. We confess that in the Apostles' Creed. Listen to these words from the Nicene Creed. The only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. You see, at the one hand, you see Jesus New Testament will tell us Jesus is fully human, as human as you and I are. At the same time, he is fully divine. He is Yahweh made flesh. Lutheran teachers call this the personal union. You can dazzle your friends this afternoon talking about this. It's called the personal union. And it says, I, this, this concept, this teaching, the teaching that God gives us is simply this. Jesus has two natures. He has a divine nature and he has a human nature. Two natures. Divine nature, human nature, but one person. But one person. And what Jesus does, he does as both. He's always together as both. And I say that because, because of this. I, I read a lot of things as, like you do. And I read things and writers and hear people talk and what, what they're doing, whether they realize it or not, they're emphasizing this human side of Jesus, talking about Jesus is our brother and Jesus knows what it's like to be here and, and, and he's our brother and what's going on with us and he knows everything's going on. And that's their emphasis is this human side of Jesus. They keep emphasizing that over and over again. But there's another side. And the other side is simply this, is that people will say, no, that's not right over there. He is human, but that's what we need to emphasize. We need to emphasize that Jesus is divine. Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is God Almighty himself. Jesus is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, made flesh among us. And that's what we need to emphasize. And the problem with that is they're both right and they're both wrong. And they're both wrong because Jesus always does things together. It's always two natures, one person. So you see things like 
God raised Lazarus from the dead. You can't say that. You got your Christology wrong if you say things like that. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. The God-man Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Or sit here and say, God, man is tired and sleepy and hungry. You can't say that. You can say Jesus. The God-man Jesus is hungry and tired and sleepy. What Jesus does, he always does with both natures together. Now I'll pause right here for a second and say simply this. If I don't have you just a little bit confused, I haven't done my job and I apologize. Because this is one of those things, the more you think about it, the more complicated it gets. Simply, the more complicated it gets. How, how can we have no other reference in our world of two natures being one person? Of somebody being both God and man at the same time, but yet they're separate, but they're together. It's you know, it's one of those things is that we sit here and we simply trust. It's one of those articles of faith. Articles of faith that God gives us. And when he gives us this article of faith for us to trust in and believe in, uh, he's not making us, us an arbitrator or a judge. He doesn't say you can believe in this if it makes sense. You can believe in this if you can, uh, you know, understand this. He doesn't say that. He gives us this article of faith that Jesus is both God and man. Or as the teachers like to say, the God-man Jesus. Now, why is this important? Why have I spent 20 minutes of your time talking about this this morning? Well, for really for four reasons. Number one. Number one is our problem is not that we're human. Now, some of you need to hear that. I'm going to say it again, but I want to make sure you hear me. Our problem is not that we're human. <coughs> All right, stay with me because some of you have got funny looks on your face. Our problem is not that we're human. The fact that we have these sexual desires, the fact that we have, we have um, communication problems, we have the other stuff going on, these natural things about food and other things in our life, it's, those things are not our problem. The problem is, is we're polluted by sin. And we're hopelessly polluted by sin. We're so polluted by sin, as a matter of fact, is that it's hard to separate the pollution from our humanity. But it's important to realize that human's not our problem because Jesus was human as you and I are. He's just as human as we are. Humanity is not the problem. The problem is sin. You need to keep that in mind. The second, the second thing is we need to make sure we understand is simply this, is that... Jesus had to be true man to live under the law. He had to be live under the law to suffer and die. In other words, simply, simply this, is that he needed to be like us because we live under God's law. And we've lived under God's law since the dawn of time. We live under his law, what he expects from us. And somebody had to live under that law in our place. Somebody had to live under that law because we cannot And this rolls into the third one. He needed to be human because he had to die. Because in Genesis chapter 1, or early part of Genesis chapter 2, I think it is, when God tells Adam, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Mm. But he didn't die. Paul in Romans, right, says the wages of sin is death. Somebody had to die that death. And he had to be human to do it. The third thing we need to keep in mind is that Jesus had to be fully divine because somebody had to be the perfect sacrifice. Somebody had to be perfect. I can't die for Grace. I can't die for Betty as much as I would. I can't die in God's eyes for my wife, Betty, because I'm sinful. To be able to redeem those, re die back, to be able to pay the price, to be able to make the perfect sacrifice for sins, somebody had to be perfect. And that's Jesus. The God-man Jesus who was sinless was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He had to be divine to be perfect. He had to be divine to be that perfect sacrifice that God's going to say, yes, it is finished, it's done, the price is paid. He had to be divine to be able to, be, to stand and say, he is not here, he is risen. 
the ultimate statement by the God-man, Jesus Christ, that sin, death, and the devil will not win in the end. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the fourth reason, we're going to wrap up with this one, is simply this. This is Jesus. True God and true man. True God and true man. True God and true man, as we confess in our creeds, right? Very God of very God, born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus, true God, true man, is who we serve. We as humble servants who come in humility on our knees before our Jesus, God, man, Savior. This is who we serve. We come to him and we serve him and say, you're mine. Sorry. We come to him and say, I'm yours. Get the, get the word right. Make sure you get that one, right? We come to him and say, I'm yours. And we serve him. We serve the God-man, Jesus. That's who Jesus is. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for this teaching, this teaching that just kind of blows our mind. The more we think about it, the more uh, it, it just hard for us to grasp, but help us to grasp it by faith, Father, is that your Son is both God and man here and now. He came to save us, and because of this, he saves us. Help us to be able to do this. Help us to be able to serve him and serve him in joy and in love. Amen. Mm-hmm.